Before we turn it over, I'd like to introduce everybody to Damien, uh, who's a professor at the NYU School of Medicine. Uh, I first got to know Damien uh, reading the pages of the uh, glossy uh, science journals uh, where he was publishing, it seemed like, a paper every week on a really new, cool antibody structure uh, when he was a, a graduate student at the Scripps Research Institute uh, with Ian Wilson. Uh, Damien has uh, had a track record there that I think is like almost unparalleled of, of anybody I've ever seen in science. He, he just had amazing determination to solve really interesting uh, and, and often difficult uh, structures. And they revealed a lot about uh, the immune response in different species and how to craft uh, vaccines and, and sort of a wide areas of, of structural immunology. Probably my favorite paper of his from his time as a graduate student was this weird cow antibody structure, which looked like a regular antibody, like with the alien, an alien arm popping out of it, ready to grab onto antigens. It's just really, interesting study of, of how weird evolutionary biology can get when it's trying to grab onto an antigen. So I highly encourage people to check that out. Uh, after uh, his that amazing graduate run, he uh, moved up to UCSF where he uh, was a postdoc um, and where I got to know him even better. Uh, he worked uh, with Jeff Cox and, and also a little bit with, uh, with Ron Vale. Uh, again, taking a, a really ambitious structural approach uh, to sort of de-orphanize really a, a new family of, of proteins um, that are responsible for transporting lipids in, uh, in sort of the, ser the extracellular environment of, of bacteria. Uh, that's work he's continued in his own lab and that I'm excited to hear about today. Damien is absolutely fearless in truly integrative structural biology. He melds EM and X-ray crystallography, NMR modeling better than just about anybody I know. Uh, and uh, I always enjoy hearing him talk, so I think we're in for a treat today. Uh, Damien, uh, please take it away. Thank you, Jamie. Let me just get... Okay, hopefully y'all can see that. Um, yeah, so th thanks, Jamie, for that, that very uh, kind introduction. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be sort of back at UCSF virtually um, and had a chance to, to catch up with a lot of uh, old friends and colleagues today and, and meet a few, few new people as well. Um, and so uh, I'm excited to be able to share our work with you today on, on kind of trying to unravel how bacteria move lipids between, between their membranes. Um, everything I'll tell you about today is part of a collaborative effort between my lab and Girababa's lab, who's also a, a faculty member um, at NYU, and we, we run our two labs together as kind of one super group. So uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, all cells are surrounded by plasma membrane, uh, but bacteria put a few additional layers on top of this um, as well. And so first of all, outside of the plasma membrane, there's this layer of peptidoglycan, um, which acts as sort of a skeleton and helps to give the cell its, its shape. Um, and then some bacteria, which we usually call either gram-negative bacteria or more generally double membrane bacteria, have a second lipid bilayer outside the plasma membrane um, which we call the outer membrane. And this outer membrane uh, is a really crucial barrier that protects the cell from a wide range of extracellular stresses, such as antibiotics and detergents. And so there's a great deal of interest in trying to understand how the bacterial outer membrane is assembled and maintained, because we have uh, a bunch of really great antibiotics that recognize their targets in the gram-negative cell uh, and inhibit their targets uh, very well. They just can't get across this outer membrane. Um, and so you can imagine if we, if we could understand the pathways that are involved in, in creating the outer membrane, we could potentially target these pathways with new antibiotics and render the cells much more permeable and susceptible to all these other uh, great FDA approved drugs we already have in our toolkit. Um, also, outer membrane is essential in many bacterial species. So by targeting outer membrane biogenesis, we potentially could, could kill microbes directly. So the outer membrane is an asymmetric bilayer, actually. So uh, it has an outer leaf leaflet uh, consisting of lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, 
and an inner leaflet of phospholipids. And I think that already sets up like some of the challenges uh, the cell faces in constructing this outer membrane because an asymmetric outer membrane is going to require a lot of energy to, to set up and maintain that asymmetry. But there's actually no ATP outside the plasma membrane. So everything happening outside the plasma membrane either has to occur spontaneously or has to be coupled to ATP hydrolysis in the cytoplasm. So for example, protein folding and the insertion of these outer membrane proteins uh, has to occur in the absence of ATP. And setting up and maintaining this asymmetry uh, does not, uh, the mechanisms that do this will not have direct access to, to ATP as well. So one of the major focuses in my lab is trying to understand how lipids are transported from their site of synthesis in the inner membrane to their final destination in the outer membrane. And that's, that's what I'll be telling you about today. So if you were a eukaryotic cell, how would you, how would you do this? Um, so you'd probably use vesicular trafficking. Uh, so you'd butt off a vesicle from, from one membrane, say the ER, where most lipids are synthesized in the cell. And in one fell swoop, you'd move you know, hundreds or thousands of lipids from one membrane to another, so and ultimately fuse that vesicle, say, with the, the plasma membrane. However, bacteria lack these vesicular transport pathways. And so to move lipids from one membrane to another, they're going to have to employ some other sort of mechanism. So until recently, there was only really one lipid transport system in E. coli that we understood in any real detail. And that's the LPS export system. And so the way this works is newly synthesized LPS in the inner membrane can be extracted by an ABC transporter using energy from ATP hydrolysis and those LPS molecules can be pushed along a continuous bridge that links the two membranes together. Uh, and ultimately, those LPS molecules can be delivered to the outer membrane and specifically to the outer leaflet of the outer membrane. So we, we understand reasonably well how, how the lipids in the outer leaflet of the membrane get there. But what about these phospholipids in the inner leaflet? Um, until recently, we've really not had much of a handle on, on how these lipids get there and the machinery that's involved in this process. So it turns out that there's many parallels between lipid transport uh, between the inner and outer membrane and life in a city like San Francisco. Um, you know, you're often faced when you're trying to get out of the city, how do you get from this peninsula to, to the mainland, either in Marin or, or East Bay? And so I already told you that at least some lipids are transported across bridges, uh, like these beautiful bridges that, that span the bay. Um, but it turns out that there's other mechanisms that E. coli and other bacteria use to move lipids across uh, between the two membranes. And some of these resemble ferries, and some of these resemble tunnels um, through which lipids are transported. And so today during my talk, I'll tell you about these latter two mechanisms, ferries and tunnels, and how bacteria use these to move lipids between membranes. And so the real star of my talk today is a family of transporters called, called MCE. And I'll tell you a bit about how we think these systems work. But so some of the earliest data implicating these MCE transporters in outer membrane biogenesis came from Tom Sohavi's lab. Um, and they found that when you made mutations in MCE proteins or any of the associated components of the transporter, uh, these bacteria had outer membrane defects. And so what I'm showing you here is a, a, just a simple growth assay where we've supplemented LB agar with uh, SDS and EDTA, two outer membrane perturbing agents. And you can see that whereas the wild type strain grows perfectly fine, these are just serial dilutions of a bacterial culture. When you make mutations in the MCE subunits, uh, these strains are unable to grow anymore in the presence of, of detergents. These mutants uh, have also been shown to have increased sensitivity to a wide range of hydrophobic antibiotics and dyes. And in a variety of species, MCE proteins have been shown to be important for virulence. And this includes uh, many gram-negative pathogens, such as Shigella and Leptospira, uh, but also some sort of atypical double membrane bacteria, such as M. tuberculosis. Something else we've known for a little while about MCE proteins is that they bind to phospholipids. And so uh, Georgia Isom, when she was still a postdoc, in, or sorry, a graduate student at Ian Harrison's lab, did an experiment where she expressed and purified the three MCE proteins encoded in the E. coli genome. And she took those proteins and extracted any bound phospholipids and separated them by thin layer chromatography. And what you're seeing here, these dark spots correspond to the major phospholipid species from E. coli, phosphatidylethanolamine, and phosphatidylglycerol. 
And so, so these proteins seem like they're important for the outer membrane integrity and also bind directly to phospholipids. And work from other labs has also shown both in E. coli as well as homologs in plants, uh, they, these proteins also bind to phospholipids. So a few years ago, we were able to solve the first crystal structure of one of these MCE proteins, uh, a protein called MLAD from E. coli. And there were two really cool things that came out of this structure. So first of all, up until this point, we had no expectation that these proteins were gonna be anything but monomers. But the crystal structure clearly revealed that these proteins assemble to form these homohexameric rings. And the other thing that was cool that came out of the structure was that we realized that there was this narrow channel running through the center of the MCE ring, uh, and it's lined with hydrophobic residues. And so this got us to be thinking that perhaps this, this channel running through the center of the MCE ring could be part of a pathway for the transport of lipids. So I've been telling you mostly so far about this protein MLAD, uh, which forms that hexameric ring. But it turns out in E. coli and in many other bacterial species, these MCE proteins are encoded in operons uh, along with several other subunits. And so in the case of the MLA transport system in E. coli, uh, the MCE protein is encoded along with an ABC type ATPase, uh, a multipass transmembrane protein, uh, a predicted paraplasmic soluble protein uh, that could be a substrate binding protein, uh, as well as a protein of, of poorly characterized function. And so with this parts list, we, we suggested that these proteins may form a, an ABC transporter complex. And using cryo-EM, we were able to reconstruct the complex to about 10 angstroms resolution. Um, however, apart from docking in the crystal structure of the, that hexameric MCE ring, we didn't really understand very well how the rest of the subunits in the complex came together. And in particular, the transmembrane subunit, which is really at the heart of any ABC transporter uh, based upon sequence, had no real clear homologs in the PDB uh, and no similarity to any proteins of known uh, structure or function. So we set out to try to characterize this complex in, in a bit more detail uh, using cryo-EM. And so the work I'll tell you about now uh, was a combined uh, effort between three people in the lab. Uh, Nicola Coudre, who's a, a scientist and our resident cryo-EM expert, Georgia Isom, who's a postdoc in the lab and sort of microbiologist turned structural biologist, and Mark, Mark McRae, who is a, a relatively new PhD student in the lab. Um, and so this work we actually just posted on BioArchive uh, last month, and so you're welcome to check it out later if, if you're interested in reading more. So using cryo-EM, we were finally able to reconstruct this complex to high resolution uh, at an overall resolution of about three angstroms. And here, when we color our, our uh, density map by local resolution, you can see that uh, the transmembrane region in particular is especially well resolved, um, extending to, to better than three angstroms resolution in most, most parts of that. And so from that, we were able to build a 3D model of this complete complex. Uh, and so, um, like many ABC transporters, it contains two copies of a transmembrane protein subunit and two copies of an ABC type ATPase subunit. However, it also differs from many ABC transporters in, in two particular ways. So first of all, it has that hexameric MCE subunit that's docked on top of the transporter complex like a hat. Um, and in addition, it has two copies of this small protein that are bound on either side of the ATPA subunit. And uh, we think that this protein may be involved in regulating the transporter activity. And so we recently just posted a, a preprint on, on this as well. And uh, so you're welcome to go ahead and read that. Um, I just want to plug review comments here, which I'm not sure if everyone is, is familiar with, but this was our first submission via review commons. Um, it's a way that you can uh, have your manuscript peer reviewed, not necessarily connected to any particular journal. And with your reviews in hand, you can then submit, um, submit your manuscript and your reviews to any of the affiliate journals, um, uh, about 20 journals in total, including eLife and the PLOS family of journals and Journal of Cell Biology. So we had a great experience from submission to publication. It was probably only about two months or so. Um, so it was a really great experience. 
so finally, if we rotate um, this structure about 90 degrees top to bottom, I hope for the, the structural people in the audience and, and particularly the membrane protein structural biologists, you'll appreciate how kind of unusual the transmembrane region here is. So whereas the, the helices of the, the transmembrane subunits in, in pink are tightly packed as you'd expect, there's a, a single transmembrane helix coming down from each of the six subunits of the hexameric ring on top. And these pack very sort of loosely around the periphery. So we think that they're making uh, specific contacts with the transmembrane subunit, but they leave a lot of open space and are probably actually distorting the, the local environment of the lipid bilayer. And we think that this may be important for, for the mechanism of transport, perhaps by destabilizing the local lipid environment, you, you make it easier to either extract or insert lipids uh, into the adjacent membrane. Okay, so we think that this complex will sit in the bacterial inner membrane down here. Um, and the big question is, you know, is it driving phospholipid export? So it's newly synthesized lipid as the cell grows, or could it be re-importing lipids uh, for, for a number of different reasons? And there's actually been a bit of a debate in the field as to which direction MLA is driving lipid transport. And evidence has been presented suggesting that it could either be an exporter or an importer. And so we were wondering if our structure might, might shed some light on this. So what I'm showing you here is one of those transmembrane subunits from, from the MLA complex. Uh, and the transmembrane subunits in general for ABC transporters tend to, to determine the direction uh, of transporter of the complex. And so when we compared the fold of MLAE to, to other ABC transporter structures, we realized that it was actually quite similar to the structure of the, the LPS exporter, uh, which I told you about transporting LPS via this periplasmic bridge. And so not only was the MLA-E subunit similar to the LPS exporter, but it's actually clearly homologous to, to a broadly conserved family of eukaryotic ABC exporters uh, called ABCA and ABCG. And in eukaryotic cells, the, this family of transporters is involved in the efflux of, uh, of hydrophobic drugs, such as chemotherapeutics, export of phospholipids, as well as cholesterol and sterols, such as in bile. And so based upon this structural similarity, it seems likely to us that the MLA system is driving phospholipid export to the outer membrane. Damien? Yes? Does, is all of this sort of comparison just purely inferred by the structure or are there sequence relationships here too that, that folks can unravel? Really just at the level of fold. Um, so so even, even with the structure in hand, we can't really pick out, I say, like particular motifs that are, are well conserved. Um, and there are definitely some differences. Uh, so for example, um, MLAE has, has only five transmembrane helices, which is one less than uh, either the LPS exporter or uh, the ABCA, ABC, ABCA, ABCG families. So, um, you know, uh, they, they are quite distant cousins, uh, which I think is why we weren't able to pick up these similarities before we solved the structure. Okay. So, um, so I told you that um, the, the MCE subunit has this hydrophobic channel running through the center. And so it turns out in, in the structure of the complete transporter, that channel extends further down uh, about halfway through the membrane uh, into an outward facing pocket in, in the ABC transporter itself. Um, and so we, we looked to see if we had any substrates bound in, in the transporter. <clears throat> and indeed we had really nice density for two bound phospholipids uh, in this cavity in the out outward facing pocket. Um, and so the, there were two really surprising things about these lipids. So first of all, the conformation of these lipids is, is pretty unusual. Um, you can see one lipid is kind of doing the splits with one acyl chain pointing upwards into the channel through the MCE subunit and one pointing downwards. And this other one is in a sort of distorted conformation. We were also surprised to see two lipids instead of one. Um, and so I'm going to come back to these two, two kind of puzzling points a little bit later on. But the first question we wanted to, to ask was, are these lipids actually present in the transporter in the cell? So this complex was reconstituted into lipid nanodisks, and so we weren't sure if we could have perhaps just loaded lipids into any sort of hydrophobic pocket in the protein. 
And so in order to assess whether lipids actually bind the site in cells, we took a cross-linking approach. And so um, this is using a technology that was developed in Pete Schultz's lab at the Scripps Research Institute that allows us to place an unnatural, uh, unnatural amino acid that's a photo crosslinker at any position we like in the protein. Uh, and so I won't go into all the details about how that works, but the basic idea behind our experiment was if we position this photo crosslinking amino acid in that outward facing pocket of the ABC transporter and lipids are nearby in the cell, when we induce crosslinking by a radiation with light, we should be able to crosslink a phospholipid to the MLAE protein. And if that phospholipid is labeled with P32, then we should be able to detect the incorporation of that radioactivity into the MLAE protein. And so then similarly, if there aren't any lipids nearby that crosslinker position, then we won't crosslink any lipids and we won't incorporate radioactivity into MLAE. So this was a quite a complex experiment that, that Georgia carried out. Um, just to walk you quickly through the, the overview, so, so Georgia grew the E. coli in the presence of P32 orthophosphate in order to uh, label bulk phospholipids with P32. Um, simultaneously, she overexpressed the MLA-FEDB transporter while incorporating the site-specific crosslinker at, at a variety of sites in the protein. Uh, while it, taking the live cell, she irradiated at 365 nanometers to induce crosslinking, then lysed the cell, carried out the complete membrane protein purification in the presence of P32, and then finally took her purified protein separated by SDS page and then used Kamasi staining to detect protein and uh, autoradiography to detect uh, any P32 label. Okay, so focusing on the right side. Um, so first she did this with the wild type protein with no crosslinker incorporated. And you can see she can purify the MLAE, which runs as both a monomer and a dimer on the gel. And on the bottom, you can see the radioactivity. So very little P32 labeled phospholipids are associated with, with MLAE. When she positions the crosslinker at a position uh, labeled here in green, which is just facing out into bulk lipids in the membrane, uh, you can see that she crosslinks a large amount of P32 labeled phospholipids. In contrast, if she positions the crosslinker at this red position, which is buried in the core of the protein and not expected to be accessible to phospholipids, uh, she incorporates very little P32 into MLAE protein. So then she put the crosslinker at several sites around that outward facing pocket, and she was able to detect variable amounts of crosslinking to P32 labeled lipids, suggesting that in cells, indeed, phospholipids uh, bind in this site. So because MLAE seems to be homologous to the LPS exporter, we imagine that it will function by a similar sort of mechanism. And so the LPS exporter binds newly synthesized LPS and using ATP hydrolysis extrudes that lipid upward and pushes it along that proteinaceous bridge up towards the outer membrane. And so by analogy, we imagine that the MLA transporter uh, will use ATP to extrude these lipids up through the hydrophobic pore through the center of the MCE subunit on their way up and out towards the outer membrane. However, this MLA complex, as far as we know, doesn't create a bridge across the periplasm. So something else is gonna to have to help to move these lipids uh, to their final destination. And so it turns out that we were also able to solve a crystal structure of a small periplasmic soluble protein called MLAC. And when we solved that structure, it uh, came, the protein came out of E. coli already bound to phospholipids. And so that phospholipid was present in our crystal structure. And so this protein seems poised to act as a ferry to grab lipids from the inner membrane ABC transporter complex and ferry them uh, outwards to the outer membrane as the cell grows. So this protein binds to phospholipids in a somewhat unusual way. We often think of, of proteins that recognize specific lipid head groups, but this protein actually binds only to the fatty acid tails of the lipid and makes essentially no interactions with the head group. And so this is actually important for one of those two questions, uh, one of those two puzzles about the lipid binding site in this transporter. And so you can imagine if the transporter grabs a phospholipid from um, where we expect it may come from, the outer leaflet of the inner membrane, and then tries to extrude this upwards, an MLAC protein is gonna be, uh, would prefer that the lipid 
exits the complex tails first because it wants to bind to the tails. And if the lipid exits the complex head first, um, it's not going to be able to bind that lipid very well. So what we think may actually be going on with the unusual conformations of the lipids we observe in our structure is that we may have actually trapped these lipids in the process of being inverted so that they can exit the, uh, through the MLAD pore uh, tails first. And the way we kind of envision this may happen is the head groups of both of these lipids are bound in a small polar cavity at either side of the transporter complex. And so by, by pulling this uh, charged head group into that cavity, we imagine that this will lead to a distortion in one of the two acyl chains and force it upwards towards the hydrophobic channel through the MZE subunit. And so we imagine that this cyan conformation of the lipid is sort of a first step on that pathway towards inverting the lipid entirely. Once it's in this kind of strained conformation, there are a number of hydrophobic residues uh, just above it. And we imagine that with some, uh, as this uh, fatty acid tail samples its environment, it can flip the rest of the way up and adopt a conformation sort of like, like this magenta second lipid. Now, whether the, the lipid then goes through the central pore in this extended conformation, or the flipping is completed and it exits completely tail first for MLAC binding um, is not entirely clear, but this is sort of our model for how, how this may work. Okay, so, so that may explain why we see these unusual lipid conformations, but why are there two lipids in this transporter in the first place? Is it actually transporting two lipids per cycle? Um, and this was surprising to us because I showed you this crystal structure of ours of, of the fairy protein bound to a lipid, and it's actually only bound to one phospholipid. And so one, one possible explanation um, is that while our crystal structure of the MLAE fairy protein only has, uh, sorry, of the, of the E. coli fairy protein only has one phospholipid bound, there's a few other crystal structures of homologs in the PDB, and some of these actually have two phospholipids bound in the, in the pocket of the fairy protein. And so one possibility is that the E. coli protein is actually capable of binding to more lipids simultaneously, and our crystal structure just only happened to have one. Another possibility is that uh, the MCE ring may actually be able to store lipids for, for um, later transfer to the fairy protein MLIC. And so what I've boxed out here is the region where we actually see the lipids bound in our EM structure. But there's quite a bit of space in, in this upper region here as, in, uh, here as well. And we imagine that at least one to two phospholipids could probably uh, remain in that area waiting, uh, waiting pickup by, by MLIC. Finally, because the, the uh, MCE ring is hexameric, there's actually six MLAC binding sites uh, potentially available for, for the fairy protein to bind. And so another possibility is that multiple lipids could be extruded per ABC transporter cycle, um, and they're just picked up by multiple copies of the MLAC protein that are waiting there on the ring. Okay, so, so putting this all together, how do we think this system works? So I've told you about the structure of this ABC transporter complex that's present in the bacterial inner membrane and a fairy protein that, that is in this space between the two membranes. I didn't tell you anything about it, but the structure of an outer membrane complex was also determined uh, by Vandenberg's lab in the UK. And we think that this is kind of the final piece of the puzzle. And so the way we imagine this works is that ATP hydrolysis in the cytoplasm drives lipid extraction and extrusion through this hydrophobic pore through the center of the MCE subunit. The fairy protein MLAC can then accept this phospholipid as it exits that tunnel and deliver this lipid to the outer membrane complex for its insertion. Uh, but I do wanna just stress that like, while, while export is perhaps our, our preferred model, um, there is definitely uh, some conflict in the literature and, and it is possible that the system may actually drive lipid import instead. Um, and so you could imagine just sort of reversing, reversing these steps. Hey, Amy, maybe yeah. you could get a, a little bit deeper into that. Like how, how much is it, uh, you know, does it have to really think about it one way or the other? And how much is this just going to be a dynamic process that's really, uh, you know, sort of regulated or, or responsive to some uh, equilibrium of, of lipids at, 
you know, at the various sites. Like potentially bi-directional or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, given that the intermembrane complex is A to be driven, I mean, I, I sort of imagine that, that is the, the point of that is to give it some directionality. Um, but uh, it, it's really not clear. I mean, so some, some relatively recent pulse chase experiments in, um, in Acinetobacter baumannii have suggested that in, when you make mutations in this pathway, there's a delay in the delivery of newly synthesized phospholipids to the outer membrane. So that's kind of consistent with the model uh, for lipid export. However, a lot of the original data suggested um, that uh, these mutants may have a defect in the ability to remove mislocalized lipids from the outer membrane. And so I mentioned at the beginning that this outer membrane is asymmetric. And so one way you could imagine maintaining asymmetry is whenever a lipid strays somewhere it doesn't belong. So a phospholipid flips to the outer leaflet where it doesn't belong. Uh, perhaps you could grab that lipid and just re-import it into the plasma membrane. Um, so, uh, I don't know, J jury's still out on that. I mean, I, I do really like the structural argument that, that based upon homology with, with other ABC transporters that this system will likely drive phospholipid export, um, but there are also exceptions to that rule and occasionally there are ABC transporters that adopt, say, an exporter fold that are, are shown to drive import. Since, since we've already interrupted you, I feel okay. like Let's, let's rapid fire a few questions that have accumulated too. Sure. Uh, Ruchika wants to know, can you do mass spec instead of radioactive assays? Uh, so we, we've tried that a bit. Um, particularly, that'd be nice because, you know, um, there's a question of specificity. So whether, say, this system transports all phospholipids or only uh, some phospholipids. Um, so we would like to, to be able to narrow down a little bit what, what lipids specifically are transported by, by this system. So we have tried cross-linking. Uh, well, so we, we can cross-link the lipids to the proteins, and we've tried using mass spec to identify them. So far, the spectra have been... Uh, a bit too complicated to really interpret. Um, you can imagine that, you know, I taught the major lipid species in, in E. coli are, are PE and PG, but the, uh, there's a lot of diversity in terms of chain length, uh, number of unsaturation, positions of unsaturations, and for, for, for mass spec, this starts getting to be very complicated. Uh, we are Joe, yeah, Joe, Joe wants to know, you know, can, is ML, a C concentration in the periplasm very high, high relative to the number of MLA FEDB complexes. And maybe, you know, related to that, can, can it work in both directions in a condition specific manner? Maybe both models are right, sort of elaborating on, on the point that, that I made before. Sure. Um, so MLAC is the most abundant of the various components of the system. And that kind of makes sense because, you know, that's probably going to be the, the rate limiting uh, step you could imagine. Um, so, so that makes sense. Um, yeah, in terms of the directionality, I mean, so, so actually um, <clears throat> it's been sort of a busy month in, in the, the MCE transporter world. And actually in, in the last month, uh, three preprints, including ours, have been posted uh, describing these structures and biochemical studies. Um, and uh, so in one of these papers, they have uh, developed an in vitro transport assay and they actually detect transport in both directions. Um, and so, uh, you know, we we can't rule that out. Um, one direction seems to be ATP dependent and the other direction seems to be ATP independent. Um, and so, um, you know, we're not sure if that might reflect. So, so it seems like in, import is ATP dependent and export is ATP independent. Um, so, so whether, say, the, the ATP independent direction is something kind of nonspecific happening in the assay or whether uh, you may be able to actually kind of move lipids in both directions with the system, um, I, think, I think will require some more experiments. And, and I guess sort of a, a related question then from, from Jeff uh, Cox, visiting, using his UCSF alumni privileges uh, hey, today, Jeff. you know, whether lipids still combine MLAD and a MLC mutant, noting proper capitalizations for mutants uh, and, and sort of an ATPase mutant specifically. 
Uh, yeah, we haven't we haven't done any of those uh, experiments in a cell. So um, that that would be uh, those would be some good experiments for the future. And and that I guess could potentially allow you to get at directionality. I'm assuming that's maybe what Jeff was thinking. Um, yeah, th those would be great. And now that we have this cross linking assay working, um, we've been we've been thinking about doing some of some of those experiments, but we don't know the answer yet. So so if you if you purify the protein from E. coli, yes, it will have lipids bound whether you have MLAC there or not, but we think that those lipids are probably binding spontaneously and not really being properly loaded uh, as they would in the cell. I may, I may get through three more quickies. So Joel Ernst asks, do polar head groups or acyl chain structural features impact the mechanisms or kinetics of export in any way that you've figured out? Uh, no, um, that, that is an interesting question. And, and this whole question of specificity um, beyond sort of generic phospholipids, we, we don't really know if, say, some substrates are preferred or not. Um, in our structure, uh, both here as well as the structure of the fairy protein, um, the head groups are kind of poking out into solvent. We can't really see anything beyond the, the phosphate head group. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting question. We, we've tried looking a bit by mass spec as well, um, like not cross-linked protein, but just looking at the lipids that come down. We see pretty much all phospholipids come down, but uh, again, we're not really sure if when we overexpress these proteins if the lipids we see coming down are representative of, of the natural substrates. Since we let Jeff ask a question, his PhD advisor has a question as well, an anonymous individual. Uh, he says, wonderful talk. MLAC seems to resemble the SMP domains, e.g. those in the Hermes complex of fairy lipids between the ER and mitochondria and yeast. And lipids seem similarly bound. Can you comment on any potential similarities there? Uh, SMP domains, I'm, I'm actually not 100% sure what this looks like. Uh, I'm not sure if that's like a tulip domain. Um, so at least at the time that we solved the structure of NLAC in 2017, um, it was a novel fold. It was not similar to any other known lipid binding proteins. But if if uh, if the structure of this protein you're referring to was solved after that, then, then it's possible it could be homologous. Um, but I, I suspect it's probably different. Yeah, this is Peter Walter. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, so uh, basically, the, the SMP domains have a sort of a curved beta sheet and then a greasy alpha helix in the middle, and lipids are bound just as you showed there with the, the lipid tails um, sort of in the hydrophobic environment between the spaces of the helix and the beta sheet there. The head groups dangling out and no binding specificity um, in, in that respect. So very similar architectural feature. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll have to check those out. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, and of course, any sort of parallel. Align them. Sorry? It would be interesting to align them structurally and see if there's a, 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 common, a common architecture. Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially any parallels between, say, you know, transport and bacteria and transport. Uh, so this would be between the ER and the mitochondria, I, I think you're saying, right? So, so not completely analogous, but you could imagine sort of recycling some, some components. But, well, it's, it's, um, it's in lipid biosynthesis, it's thought to an active shuttling pathway um, between, in, uh, between the two compartments. Yeah. Um, so, so a lot of traffic going through there. Yeah. Uh, and very similar need of supplying membranes with, with uh, the lipid pool. Um, and there are three of these three of these domains in the same complex, so uh, uh, sort of handing it over from one to the other. Cool. Thanks for that, mm -hmm. Lakshmi. Hi. Um, I was curious about a particular feature that I noticed when you were introducing the structure, where you have this amphipathic helix. I, I believe on the cytoplasmic side. Yes. And I was. Curious if there's uh, any lipids that you see near uh, or inside of that amphipathic helix space that might be contributing to pulling lipids from both uh, leaflets of the bilayer, so so as not to cause I don't know uh, yep. asymmetry or curvature. Yes. Um, yeah, that uh, is an interesting helix. You're talking about uh, this one here, I think, right? Yes, yes. Um, yes, uh, yeah, so that's actually uh, something that's unique about uh, MLAE as far as we can tell. Um, 
some other ABC transporters have kind of uh, these amphipathic helices. This one, I mean, it's in a structurally different location, but same idea. Um, yeah, we think that it could be uh, involved in, in, you know, distorting the membrane uh, to perhaps to make it easier to pull lipids out or in, in certain new lipids. Um, so it actually, uh, I don't have a great figure of it here, but um, it is actually forming a cleft between that helix and the, the core of the ABC transporter fold. It's not, it's not tightly packed against the, the complex all the way across. And we do see some additional density there that looks kind of like phospholipids and they, they look kind of uh, not in the orientation you'd expect in the membrane, like kind of rotated you know, 45 degrees from, from normal uh, membrane lipid geometry. Um, so not quite so clear as the other lipid density we saw there, so we're not 100% certain of that. Um, but yeah, de definitely a kind of really interesting part of the protein that might be be functionally important. Yeah. And we've made some mutations. If we remove that helix entirely, uh, we lose function, although the complex still forms. So, um, so there's something important going on in, in that region, but exactly what we don't know. Okay, we're gonna let you resume now and, okay. and let the uh, interrogation build up again. Cool, all right, I'm ready for you at the end. Uh, all right, so in the, in the bit of time I have left, um, so I've told you uh, uh, quite a bit now about uh, this first MCE protein. It's one of the simplest MCE proteins we know. It has just a single transmembrane helix and an MCE domain. But E. coli has three MCE proteins. And so I'd like to tell you about what we think is probably the most complicated MCE protein we know so far. Um, and so that's this protein called LET-B, which was previously called YEB-T. Um, and so in addition to that transmembrane helix, it has seven of these MCE domains all strung together in a single polypeptide chain. And so given its, its much greater size and, and kind of different domain organization, we thought that this protein may function differently from the system I've told you about so far. And so again, uh, Nicolas Coudre and, and Georgia Isom were the, the driving force behind this work. And so using combination of uh, genetics, biochemistry, and, and cryo-EM, uh, they've been trying to unravel how this protein let B functions in the cell. Um, and, and so this was recently uh, published on, uh, uh, posted on BioArchive last year as well. Okay, so this is the structure of the first MCE protein I've been telling you about. It adopts a single hexameric ring. So using cryo-EM, they were able to determine the structure of LET-B to approximately three and a quarter angstrom resolution. And this is the structure that they obtained. Um, so it's a much larger complex, as you might expect, based upon the primary sequence. And it looks effectively like you took that single MCE ring and duplicated it and stacked seven of them all on top of each other to make this elongated barrel. So we can pull out one subunit so you can see a little more clearly how this is organized. So those seven MCE domains from the primary sequence uh, ultimately are arranged in the structure uh, in a straight line, almost like beads on a string. And so then six copies of this linear protomer come together laterally to form this, this large barrel-like assembly. So it's a pretty big protein complex. Uh, overall, it's about 225 angstroms in length. And it turns out that this is right about the same size as the average distance between the inner and outer membrane in E. coli. And so we imagine that this complex is gonna be anchored here at the bottom in the inner membrane by a transmembrane helix that comes off each of the six subunits. And then it'll project outwards uh, almost all the way to the outer membrane and perhaps interact with, with the complex there in the outer membrane. So because we've taken seven rings with a pore through the middle and all stacked them on top of each other, we actually end up creating a, a long tunnel through the entire let B protein from the bottom close to the inner membrane all the way up uh, to the top close to the outer membrane. And so what I'm showing you here on the left is, is that tunnel represented as, as a surface and colored by hydrophobicity. And you can see by and large, this tunnel is, is largely hydrophobic in nature. And it's constructed in a very uh, kind of interesting way. So the walls of the tunnel aren't formed by the MCE domains themselves, but actually um, a beta hairpin from each of the subunits projects inwards towards the, the pore. Um, and these, these beta hairpin loops are, are actually the, the, the element that forms the wall of the tunnel. So that's this region highlighted here in red. 
And so if we were to have a closer look at some of these loops, so this is effectively like we're inside the tunnel looking at the walls around us. Um, you can see that these loops, uh, all the side chains that are pointing towards the interior of the tunnel are hydrophobic. So this seems like uh, a great environment uh, to, that we've created for lipid transport. So we've got this long, greasy tunnel uh, that basically runs from one membrane to the other. And so this led to a model that, let be pro that the let be protein effectively functions as a tunnel to move lipids between the inner and outer membrane in E. coli. So if this model is correct, you'd expect that the length of the let be protein is going to be really important for its function. And so Mark McRae, when he was a rotation student in the lab, set out to test this. And so the approach he took was to try to engineer variants of let be that are shorter by removing one ring at a time. And so uh, he set out to make this whole series of constructs. So let B has seven rings in the wild type protein, but he made one that's six, five, four, three, or only two rings long. And so then the big challenges here were, can we actually engineer these proteins in the first place? Are they stable? Um, and if he can make these proteins, can we develop an assay to actually see if they're functional in cells? And so what Mark did, he cloned all these constructs and then he looked at them all by negative stain after purification to assess whether they actually adopted the expected structure. And so, uh, so here's the 2D class average for the wild type protein. And what you can see are these seven layers of density that correspond to the seven rings in the mature protein. And so he did these for, this for all of these variants and he found he could make a six ring version, a five ring version, a four, three, and two ring version. And so all of these um, ended up folding reasonably well. Uh, and so then he went, then went on to see if they were able to function in E. coli. And so to do this, uh, he used a, an assay we developed based upon the, uh, a phenotype the mutant has. So it's a, especially sensitive to a particular detergent called LSB, uh, lauryl sulfur betaine. Uh, and so on the left here, you're seeing the strain spotted only on LB. And so you can see that the parent strain, the let B knockout, as well as the complemented let B knockout all grow perfectly fine. Uh, but when we spot them uh, on plates that have this detergent included, you can see the knockout fails to grow, but we can complement it with let B protein in a plasmid. And so um, he was then able to, to put all of those different variants he made back into this knockout strain and see, do they restore growth uh, like a wild type copy of the gene or are they non-functional? And so just to summarize these results, he found that the wild type protein as well as variants that had five or six rings uh, were able to restore growth uh, comparable to the wild type. However, all of the shorter proteins failed to grow. Um, and so that suggests that let B needs to achieve a particular length in order to, to restore function in the cells, consistent with the idea that, that it may need to reach across from the inner membrane to the outer membrane and form a continuous uh, bridge or tunnel. So it, it turned out though that we didn't solve just one structure of let B. Um, using cryo-EM, we were able to sort out uh, two major conformations of the protein. And what I'm showing you here are, are a morph between those two states. Uh, and so when you look at the complex from the side, you can see that the MCE domains themselves undergo this sort of rotary motion, which I think of sort of almost like the, the paddles of a pinball machine. Um, so, so they undergo this rotation. And then when you look at these rings from the top, you can see that those pore lining loops that I said actually make up the tunnel lining they, they are also undergoing these conformational changes that switch the rings from, from a wide open state that would uh, be capable of transporting lipids to a tightly closed state that would potentially block transport. And so just to kind of show this to you a little more schematically, so the MCE domains themselves undergo this sort of pivoting motion uh, and then the loops uh, are also quite dynamic. And so this is, this is the ring that undergoes the, the largest conformational changes. In the open state, uh, the pore is sufficiently large to allow the passage of probably two phospholipids uh, simultaneously, but in the closed state, not even a single phospholipid would be able to fit through the channel. And so we're not really sure what these dynamics are for. Um, it's possible that these dynamics are important for actually driving lipids through the, tam the tunnel and could potentially be coupled to conformational changes in an active transporter in the inner membrane, for example. Um, it's also possible they could be involved in gating transport. So perhaps uh, 
you open the channel when you want to move lipids through and you can close the channel down uh, to block the flow. Um, so that's something that, that we still don't really have a great handle on and we'll have to explore uh, more in the future. Um, finally, uh, so while we, we've known for a while that, that all of these proteins bind phospholipids, uh, we didn't really know that these lipids are present in this central tunnel. Um, so let B is a membrane associated protein, so it's possible that those lipids could be just binding uh, at either end where we expect it'll be interacting with the membranes. But what we really wanted to know is are lipids present in the tunnel um, consistent with a role for uh, role of this protein as a, as a pathway for lipid movement between the two membranes. And so to test this, uh, we again turn to our cross-linking assay. Uh, and so Georgia, she placed cross-linker in a variety of locations within that hydrophobic tunnel of let B, as well as on the outside. And so the interior positions are labeled in red and the exterior positions are labeled in blue. And so if our model is correct, we expect to see lipid cross-linking at uh, these red positions inside the tunnel, whereas these solvent exposed positions where we don't expect to find lipid, uh, we would not expect to see any cross-linking. And so uh, starting with the wild type protein with no cross-linker incorporated, uh, we're looking whether we see incorporation of P32 labeled phospholipids, uh, and we don't see much uh, protein or much label incorporation in that case, that's good. When we put the cross-linker at positions within the tunnel, we see significant cross-linking to P32 labeled phospholipids. Uh, and in positions outside the tunnel, we see much less uh, cross-linking to phospholipids, suggesting that lipids are present in the central tunnel uh, as opposed to, say, on the outside. And all of this is dependent upon um, cross-linking. So if she takes the exact same samples and doesn't irradiate them, uh, we see very little uh, incorporation of P32 into the protein. Okay, so I just want to sum up um, what I've told you. So in addition to, to systems that use uh, proteinaceous bridges or ferries to move lipids across the, the envelope, uh, we think the let B protein sits in this space forming a tunnel uh, to allow lipids to be transported through a closed tube uh, between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. Uh, functioning like a tunnel. I didn't tell you about it today, but let B forms a complex with an inner membrane protein called let A. So we're very interested in understanding how they interact. Uh, and we think let A may be involved in, in driving the transport process. And so perhaps by analogy with what we know about MLA, uh, perhaps let A is, is driving lipid extraction from the inner membrane, perhaps using ATP hydrolysis as a source of energy and pushes those phospholipids through this long hydrophobic tunnel. All the way out to the outer membrane. And uh, we hypothesize that there's going to be a complex here in the outer membrane that will accept that phospholipid and mediate its insertion into the outer membrane. Uh, but at this point, we, we really don't know for sure if that complex exists or, or what its identity may be. So with that, uh, I think I acknowledged uh, all the people involved in this work along the way. So I'd just like to, to acknowledge uh, this great group of people uh, in the lab that makes it uh, really fun to go into work every day. Uh, and I'd be happy for the interrogation to resume if, uh, if there are any more questions. So first of all, I'll just, you know, clap on, on behalf of everyone. Uh, I will start by uh, Unmuting my colleague Yifan Cheng, who typed a question, and I'll allow him to ask uh, in person, virtually, if he unmutes. Uh, very uh, beautiful talk. I just wondered that when you show this let B, that there's a conformation change on this ring that is going up and down, and then in in your movie, uh, it's a morphing movie that all the subunits behave similarly, and how does they coordinate between this? Yeah. Between yeah. the neighboring subunit, or yeah, is that's that an interesting way question. to coordinate, or they random, or they? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question, um, and so um, so I, I I kind of glossed over it, but um, so so actually some of the rings move and some of them don't, so that that's one interesting thing. So you can see that these uppermost three rings in the bottom ring move uh -huh. a lot, but these three here in the middle actually don't move much, like that movie is playing, but they're, they're not moving. Um, so the upper three rings definitely move together. Um, so we basically just get two classes, either open or close. 
Um, the bottom ring may move independently, so we're not sure if it moves in concert with the upper rings. Yeah. Particularly if these middle three rings don't move much, it's sort of hard to imagine how the bottom and the top could be kind of communicating and, and moving together. What, uh, what about the subunit between the ring? Like in the ring, there are different subunits because this each one, each ring is formed by six different subunits, right? Yes. And then they, they, are, they are basically one polypeptide chain is going to form one subunit of the six ring, right? Is that right? Uh, one polypeptide chain forms one domain from each ring. Oh, so one like domain for each ring, right? So how does this domain, it also looks the, all the, uh, in synchronized. Yeah, so, so within each ring, um, it seems like all the domains move similarly and in the same direction. Um, uh, Is that because the interaction between them making them to go in this way or there's some other sort of, um, you know, what the, yeah. Yeah, um, it, it, yeah, it seems like, um, you know, it, it's a very kind of strange motion. Um, it, it's relatively subtle, but um, they, yeah, they, they do seem to move together. I mean, it's not entirely obvious um, why they have to move together. Like looking at the structure, you, you could almost imagine one domain moving independently. I mean, one thing I should say is that we are um, using C6 symmetry here, so. That's right, that's right. Oh, I see, okay, okay. Yeah, it's, it's possible that there could be some, you know, uh, small differences. Um, and also, you know, it's possible that there are, you know, like non, I mean, we, we also tried uh, no symmetry as well and didn't really see any differences and this just gave us higher resolution, but, but it's possible that there are other like asymmetric states that, um, you know, are, are lowly populated that we're, we're not picking up very well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, Daniel. Uh, so I just had a general question, I guess, about um, the bridge tunnel and ferries. Do mm -hmm. you see a preferred length for um, transport? Like, would longer ones take the bridge or something? Oh, like in terms of lipid size? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so actually, I, 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 that's a that's a good uh, point you raise, and and I do think that um, size, like, that that is a factor here. So, so the head group of LPS. Um, in the little animation I showed, um, I showed a very small version of it. Um, but the reality is that, uh, so each LPS molecule can weigh as much as a small protein. So it could be like 10 kilodaltons. And most of that is in the, is in the head group. So you can imagine if you try to push this through a tunnel, either the tunnel has to be really big, uh, or um, also if you're creating a tunnel that's say mostly hydrophobic inside and you've got a really big hydrophilic head group, that's gonna be, uh, be a problem. So it seems like the strategy nature has taken is in this case, we've got a really big head group. It's easier to kind of push things along a bridge. Uh, the bridge is hydrophobic to accommodate the, the fatty acid tails um, and you can leave that, that big head group in solution. Um, the ferry you all imagine also could potentially um, accommodate sort of any kind of head group because just pointing out into solution. Uh, whereas a tunnel seems like it's probably gonna be more restricted um, and, and, you know, anything that's really big, either you'll have to have a really big tunnel um, or if it's, you have a really big hydrophilic head group, um, that's going to be harder to deal with. Um, and I think I've already kind of like poked, you know, like one problem that, that you know, we still don't really understand about the tunnel mechanism is, um, I mean, indeed phospholipids do have a charged head group and somehow they have to, to move through this largely hydrophilic tunnel um, and, and exactly how that works, um, we, we don't fully understand just yet. Uh, hi, Damien. This is Ruchika. I hey. was just wondering. Uh, I was just wondering your lat, lat B. You know, you have those mutants, uh, um, smaller mutants of lat B. I was just okay. wondering if those uh, uh, can help take help from your fairy protein and uh, transfer, or I mean, come to the kind of a wild type phenotype which you showed in your assay. Uh, yes. Um, as far as we know, they can't. But. Um, do we have any data that really speaks to that? I mean, but, but I, I think you had introduced or expressed another protein, protein to, I mean, to, to convert the phenotype back to the wild type. I was wondering if that could be done by just fairy protein or something analogous to that. 
in the same system? Yeah, not so far as we know, but, you know, so, so when we're testing the shorter variants, the fairy protein, like the endogenous fairy protein would still be present. So if it was able to, say, pick up the lipid as it exited a shorter tunnel and, and yeah. transport process, so it, it's there and that opportunity would be there. So, um, so you know, why, why, I didn't even tell you about the third system E. coli has, but, but why it has these three systems, um, we're not really sure. And it, it could be that, that this uh, let B system transporting through the tunnel is transporting different kinds of cargo, uh, like different classes of phospholipids. And, and so they might not be redundant or really be able to substitute for each other um, so readily. I had another question about like in the previous system, the one fairy one, or I mean, you had those yellow color regulatory sub I don't remember the letter of those, yeah. but uh, did you do any assays with that, like if they're regulating the ATPase activity of your complex or anything with MLSC, like if there is an activation with uh, that ferry protein uh, coming there? Yes. Um, okay, so so first question about this this potential regulatory protein. Um, so uh, we we do think it is uh, regulating the activity of the transporter, but it, and we initially thought that by binding to the ATPase subunit, it was gonna change the activity. And it turned out that that wasn't exactly the case. Um, and, and so it seems that actually in the absence of this small regulatory protein, um, you completely lose the ATPase subunits from the complex. Um, so uh, it's a kind of complicated mechanism um, to describe, and I don't have a great figure, but, but the C terminus of this ATPA subunit also has this uh, long extra kind of like 25 amino acids that interacts. So it, it kind of, the, the tail from one subunit wraps around the other subunit and interacts with the regulatory protein. And it seems like when the regulatory protein is no longer there, you'll probably lose this kind of embrace between the two ATPA subunits and the whole thing falls apart. So the, the transmembrane subunit and, and the top will still be there in the cell, uh, but these guys fall apart. So it means that they are kind of shuttling between cytoplasm and uh, periplasm, I mean, near the cytoplasm, uh, near the yeah. membrane kind yeah, of we, thing. We, so yeah, we think that may be the case. Like, so it's, it's regulating sort of the assembly of the complex and, re, you know, so it, it helps to bring the ATPase to the transporter to turn it on. And uh, that is regulated by what, like transcription or something? Uh, uh, yeah, inside? That, that, that's a great question. Um, we, you know, we don't know for sure. Um, so some homologs of this regulatory protein. So, so this uh, protein adopts what's called a stos domain. Um, and so in B. subtilis, this protein, uh, homologs of this protein are involved in, in regulation of sporulation. And they actually can be phosphorylated on a conserved serine or threonine residue. That residue is actually conserved as a serine or threonine in our regulatory protein as well. And that residue is right at the interface between these proteins. So our sort of hypothetical mechanism, which we haven't really proven, is that um, this protein may actually be regulated by phosphorylation. Uh, and so phosphorylation of the yellow protein may cause it to fall off and therefore cause the ATPA subunits to fall off. And yeah, let's go back to your MLSC interaction with the, this green, uh, green thing. I mean, does that also increase your ATP, ATPase activity? Because now the cargo is, be, now, the, now there's a need to cargo to move. So, I mean, that could be another signal to increase the ATPase activity. Yeah, and actually, um, so uh, uh, Tim Knowles' lab at the University of Birmingham in the UK, he, uh, his lab did this experiment and actually they found that indeed, uh, yeah, MLAC can stimulate, so the ferry protein can stimulate the ATPase activity of this complex. Um, and it only stimulates when you add MLAC protein that has no lipid bound. So um, usually when you purify the MLAC from E. coli, it comes with a bit bound. So that is unable to stimulate the ATPS activity. So only the empty ferry that is capable of picking up a lipid uh, stimulates the ATPase. Okay, thank you for answering the, these questions. Yep, no problem. I mean, I was just curious about the potential suppressors you have in your let B mutant. Um, you're looking for the complex on the other side of the, of, uh, on the outer membrane. Maybe that's a you have gain of function mutations that help that complex reach the shorter or absent. But the you know what I'm referring to? Uh, yeah, are you saying like some of the kind of spontaneous we, growth we get in the mutant or something? Or 
Yeah, you had to mutant under stress, and there were a few colonies popped up, and I was curious if you looked at those suppressors at all. Uh, yeah, we haven't looked at any of those. Um, that, that's a good idea. That could be really informative. I'm thinking something else sort of gains function to fill in for it, whatever that might be. It could even be activation of one of the other two pathways you mentioned, which could give you some insights into compensatory mechanisms, or it could be gain of function that fills in the, the gap somehow, which could be really interesting. Yep, that's uh, something that we should definitely do at, uh, have a look at. Cool. Um, we haven't right. done that. Well, now that Joe's ruined a beautiful structural biology talk with genetics, um, <laughs> let's, uh, and, and it appears to be darkening uh, on the East Coast. Uh, yes. Let's all uh, thank uh, Damien for a, a great uh, seminar, lots of, of wonderful uh, stuff, and hope that uh, he'll come back to uh, tell us about the next stage of this story in person sometime in the not too distant future. So thank you everybody for joining QBI again and, and we'll, we'll see you soon.